This is the White's company's safety orientation. It will introduce you to our most important safety rules and procedures. However, this is only an orientation. Job site hazards and conditions will require additional training. This safety orientation contains a test designed to confirm your understanding of our safety rules and procedures. Pay careful attention. Working safely is a condition of employment and requires your cooperation. Project Safety Planning. At the start of each shift, White's employees and subcontractors complete a daily safety huddle and stretch and flex to prepare themselves mentally and physically for the tasks occurring that day. Stretch and flex is to be completed again following lunch. A JSA is used by White's employees and subcontractors to plan the precautions necessary to complete their tasks safely. All employees and subcontractors, regardless of tier, are required to plan how they will safely complete each scope of the work by completing a job safety analysis. White supervision shall review the JSA for all high hazard work tasks. Upon completion of a task, JSAs shall be turned into the project team and retained in the project files. Personal protective equipment. Shorts, tank tops, cutoff pants, and sleeveless shirts are not permitted on White's projects. Type 2 safety helmets are required on our job sites. Type 2 safety helmets are designed to reduce impact force as a result of a blow to the top or sides of the head. Wear your Type 2 safety helmet correctly with the chin strap connected and suspension system worn to the rear according to the manufacturer's instructions. Safety glasses, meeting NCZ87 are to be worn during all work activities. Safety glasses will protect your eyes from injury and even blindness. Wear them at all times. Goggles create a seal around eyes and should be worn when working with chemicals or in dusty environments to protect your eyes from liquid, sprays, and particles. The White's company requires that a high visibility vest or clothing be worn at all times on all projects. Face shields cover the gaps between the safety glasses and your eyes for more complete protection. Wearing a face shield protects your eyes and your face. Work boots are required to protect your feet from splinters, falling materials, impacts, cutting, and burns. Impermeable rubber boots are required when working in concrete or other materials. Steel toe boots and metatarsal guards are required for jackhammering and demolition. Steel toe boots are required on all industrial projects. Respirators protect your nose, mouth, lungs from airborne materials. You must be fitted and trained before wearing a respirator. Wear respirators appropriate for the hazards. Use hearing protection when exposed to high noise levels caused by equipment, motors, and power tools. If noise levels are high enough to make you raise your voice or speak to someone three feet or less away, you need to use hearing protection. Gloves will protect your hands from scrapes, splinter cuts from sharp metal, slicing knives, and burns. At a minimum, cut resistant level four shall be worn at all times. In addition to gloves, forearm protection is required when removing sealing grids or other similar material which could cause a laceration. Certain chemicals will require the use of impermeable gloves. Fall protection. Falls are the number one cause of construction fatalities. All works at heights of six feet or greater requires fall prevention or protection. Fall prevention, such as handrails, prevents a fall from occurring. Fall protection, like a full body harness and retractable, limit the fall distance and will protect you from serious and fatal injuries. The first step in preventing a fall is to carefully plan the work. Consider all the fall hazards and the protection options. All fall protection equipment must be thoroughly inspected prior to use. If a harness or lanyard has any tears, cuts, or burns that reduce its strength, it's not to be used. Lanyards or retractables with rips, tears, or non-functioning snap hooks may have also been used in a fall and should also be destroyed. The full body harness must be worn properly, both for comfort and safety. Always confirm you are wearing the correct size harness and that it fits properly. All anchorage points, straps, ropes, and D-rings must be rated for 5,000 pounds or have a safety factor of two. 
Examine each anchor point to ensure it will support you in the event of a fall. Always use properly rated straps and connections. Limit your free falling distance to six feet or less. Keep your anchor point to the same height or higher as you de-ring. Handrails must be installed on the leading edges, six feet or higher above a lower level. Top rails must support a force of at least 200 pounds, mid rails of 150, and tow boards 50. The top rail is to be installed at a height of 42 inches. The mid rail is to be at the height of 21 inches. A tow board at least three and a half inches is also required. When installation of handrails is not practical, warning lines and tie-off or 100% tie-off is required to protect workers from falls. Warning lines must be wind resistant and high visibility. Warning lines are to be installed six feet from the leading edge of roofing work and 15 feet from the leading edge for all other work. If work must be completed beyond the warning line, fall protection equipment must be used. Controlled decking zones and controlled access zones are not allowed on White's projects. If a warning line is not feasible, 100% tie-off is required. Floor holes and openings create a double fall hazard. Hole covers are required to protect everyone from trips, falls, and falling materials. Hole covers must be capable of supporting two times the maximum intended load, secured, and clearly labeled hole. Scaffold. Scaffold must be erected, moved, dismantled, or altered only under the supervision of a competent person. An OSHA competent person is one who has a thorough understanding of the standards governing the work activity, is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards, and can take prompt corrective action. Only trained and experienced persons selected by a competent person perform scaffold work. Before a scaffold can be placed into service, the competent person must properly tag it. The scaffold tag communicates to the scaffold users the condition of the scaffold. The tag must be signed by the competent person and installed at or near the entranceway. A green tag indicates the scaffold is complete and ready for use. A yellow tag indicates the scaffold is complete, but users will need to use fall protection. A red tag is used on a scaffold that is incomplete or has a safety deficiency. All scaffold bases shall be in accordance with the OSHA standards. Scaffolds should be fully cross-braced below the working levels. All working levels on a scaffold shall be fully planked. Handrails and tow boards will be installed on open sides and ends of all scaffolds higher than six feet. Proper access is to be provided for accessing scaffold. The White's company requires that workers use fall protection during the erection and dismantling of scaffold at all times. All enclosed scaffolds should be tied back to prevent overturning as per the scaffold manufacturer's requirements. In many cases, an engineer will be required to determine the tieback method. Ladders. Ladders are to be the last choice for accessing elevated work areas on White's projects. The cost of alternate means of accessing the work area is not to be a factor when determining whether to issue a permit for working from an extension ladder. 100% fall protection is required if work is to be performed at the height of six feet or more from an extension ladder. Step ladders eight feet or less are allowed to be used without a permit. When step ladders are used, platform style step ladders are the preferred ladder. The ladder use permit must be completed and approved by the project team for requests to use step ladders greater than eight feet in height or extension ladders for a duration of greater than one week. The ladder permit will be affixed to all ladders while in use. The inspection safety checklist on the back of the permit will be completed prior to use. The ladder and safety inspection checklist will be completed by a competent person. Struck by hazards and mobile equipment. Struck by hazards by mobile equipment will cause injuries with extreme power and speed. Your first line of protection is to stay alert and avoid these hazards. Always make eye contact with the operator. Never walk behind backing equipment. Keep out of operator blind spots. Never stand under a swinging load. Operators and signal persons should never allow coworkers under swinging loads. The potential for injury is sudden and severe. Proper setup is critical to crane safety. 
Outriggers are to be fully extended and placed on base plates, pads, or blocking to spread the load. The crane must be level and stable. The swing radius of cranes shall be marked and guarded to protect personnel from being struck or crushed by the rotating counter swing. The crane shall be operated only within its rated load capacity. Any lifts over 75% of capacity are considered to be critical lifts and require the completion of a critical lift checklist. All forklifts require a pre-operation inspection. Use three points of contact when getting on and off and always operate the forklift with the seat belt buckled. Forklifts must be operated within the rated capacity and only by employees who have received both hands-on operator and classroom training. Drive the forklift at speeds that allow for safety of everyone working around you. Before operating a boom lift, you must be trained and make a visual inspection before each use. When riding in or operating a boom lift, you must wear fall protection attached to the labeled anchor point. The operator is responsible for the safe operation of the boom lift. Ensure that all controls function properly. While booming up, watch your direction of travel and stay clear of overhead power lines and obstructions. Make sure the area is clear of all personnel and vehicles before rotating, extending, or driving the aerial lift. Any White's employee that drives a company vehicle or personal vehicle for company business must be on the approved driver's list. An approved driver must have a valid driver's license, have signed the vehicle use agreement, and satisfactorily passed the review of their driving record. Seat belts are required at all times while driving on company business. A hands-free device shall be used for making phone calls while operating a company vehicle. Approved drivers represent the White's company to the public and are required to operate their vehicles in a courteous manner, obeying all traffic laws. Electrical Safety Energized electrical work will be performed on White's projects only when the interruption of power to an existing facility would create a life safety issue. Only the executive vice president for each location can approve energized electrical work. All testing of energized electrical parts will be done as per the requirements of NFPA 70E. Electrical rooms are to be clearly marked and locked. Individuals with access to the electrical room are to be listed on the pre-energization plan. Any individual who potentially may be exposed to live electrical parts must affix their own individual lock and tag. Portable cord and plug connected equipment and extension cords shall be visually inspected before use on any shift for external defects such as loose parts, deformed or missing pins, or damage to outer jacket or insulation, and for evidence of possible internal damage such as pinched or crushed outer jacket. All electric tools and equipment must be used with a ground fault circuit interrupter. The best way to avoid accidents involving extension cords is by acknowledging that extension cords pose a threat. Most accidents happen because people are simply unaware of how dangerous they can be. By acknowledging the threat, you can protect yourself and your coworkers from accidents. A GFCI protects you from line to ground faults. Test the GFCI daily. It can save your life. High voltage electrical lines are extremely dangerous. Always consider them energized. Conduct a pre-job survey to determine if overhead power lines are present. A minimum clearance distance of 20 feet must be maintained for lines that are 350 kilovolts or less. For overhead power lines greater than 350 kilovolts, a minimum clearance distance of 50 feet must be maintained. Clearly mark the minimum clearance distances with elevated warning line and signs. Lockout tagout. Employees and subcontractors must use lockout tagout procedures to control hazardous energy during work on equipment or power systems. OSHA and the White's company require that all energy sources to the machine or equipment you work on be shut off and reduced to a zero energy state. All personnel exposed to hazardous energy sources must place their lock and tag on the control switch. A meeting between all involved subcontractors and the White's project team should be held prior to any work to review the lockout procedures and establish clear communications with everyone involved. Be certain to verify that circuits and equipment have been de-energized. Each authorized person must place their own individual differently keyed locks and tags on systems and or equipment 
to control all hazardous energy sources. Personal verification of energy isolation shall be conducted by the authorized person prior to starting work. Verification must include, at a minimum, the placement of lockout tagout locks at each source and confirming zero energy state. A meeting between all involved subcontractors and the White's project team should be held prior to any work to review the lockout procedures and establish clear communications with everyone involved. Be certain to verify that circuits and equipment have been de-energized. Power tools. Inspect tools for damage. Unsafe and broken tools shall be tagged. Do not use. Check the label on all tools and equipment. Those requiring grounding must have ground plugs. Tools designed to be double insulated have the double square on the label. Throw away broken and non-approved equipment. Return tag tools to the job trailer. Power tools and equipment shall be operated with working guards and handles in place. Guards and handles are not to be removed from power tools under any circumstances. Always keep your hands and fingers away from the saw blade. Never hold the materials one-handed. Instead, place it on a solid table with your hands and legs clear of the blade. As a White's employee, you will use a wide variety of tools. Ensure that you have been trained and understand the safe operating practices and required PPE for each tool. Many tools, such as powder actuated tools, require certified training. Confined space entry. Confined spaces create serious health and safety hazards. A confined space is a space with the following characteristics. Large enough and configured so as to allow bodily entry, limited or restricted means of entry or exit, not designed for continuous human occupancy. Each project is to be assessed to determine if confined spaces are present. All confined spaces should be evaluated using the pre-entry decision flowchart located in the safety manual. Many confined spaces contain hazardous atmospheres. All confined spaces must be tested before entry is made. Before entering any confined space, a completed confined space entry permit is required. All entrants, the attendant, and supervisor must sign the permit prior to entry. You must complete confined space training before entering and working in a confined space. Trenching. Trenches and excavations create potential hazards for everyone entering and working in them. The weight of collapsing soil will trap and suffocate even the strongest person. The competent person for each trench or excavation, regardless of depth, is required to complete the daily dig permit. The daily dig permit is to be reviewed by the White's project team prior to the start of work. Any trench or excavation with the potential to collapse is to be protected. OSHA requires cave-in protection to be used for all trenches five feet or deeper. Sloping, shoring, trench shields, and trench boxes are to be used as per the OSHA and manufacturer standards. The competent person for the trench or excavation is to use the White's Excel spreadsheet to be used to determine cave-in protection methods for all trenches five feet or deeper. All trenches and excavations greater than four feet in depth require ramps, ladders, or stairs for access. Travel distance to an access point is not to exceed 25 feet. If excavations are left open at the end of the day, they must be flagged or barricaded. Concrete placement safety. Placing concrete will expose you to many serious hazards. The proper PPE is critical when placing concrete. Impermeable overshoes and gloves are necessary for preventing concrete burns. An eyewash station and neutral light is to be present during concrete placement for the prevention of concrete burns. Concrete pumps use tremendous pressure to move concrete through a series of pipes and hoses. A failure in the system can be explosive and cause serious injuries. During a system pour, when pipes are used to move concrete, precautions must be taken. Stay alert for surges. The discharge hose may kick violently and cause serious injury. All exposed rebar is to be protected with steel reinforced caps to prevent workers being impaled. Rebar caps should also be used to protect anchor bolts, stakes, and T-posts. Special Procedures Improper lifting can cause injuries which impact you both at work and at home. When lifting, get as close to the load as possible. Bend at the knees, not at the waist. Carry loads close to your body as possible. Avoid twisting while carrying the load. 
The White's company requires you to get help lifting materials or tools that weigh more than 50 pounds. Material or equipment that weigh more than 150 pounds is not to be moved manually. Safety data sheets must be present for all chemicals used or stored on the project. Read and understand information contained in the SDS for the chemicals you use. In the event of an emergency, a safety data sheet can be obtained by calling a 1-800 service subscribed to by Whites. The 1-800 number is to be posted throughout your project. Silica. Exposure to respirable crystalline silica can occur during common construction tasks, such as masonry saws, grinders, drills, jackhammers. When workers cut, grind, drill, or crush materials that contain crystalline silica, very small dust particles are created. These tiny particles, known as respiratable particles, can travel deep into workers' lungs and cause silicosis, an incurable and sometimes deadly lung disease. Employees exposed to silica need to be properly trained and engineering controls must be in place. To control silica exposures, there are wet methods that use water sprays to control dust and dry methods such as ventilation controls that use vacuums and high efficiency particulate air HEPA filters to control dust. Each task must be evaluated to ensure preventative measures are documented on the silica prevention pan. Use of respirators as a sole means of protection is not permissible. Nothing hits the floor. At our company, we emphasize the importance of maintaining clean and safe work environments. We firmly believe that no project can be truly safe without cleanliness and organization. As part of our nothing hits the floor policy, it is essential that waste and materials are immediately removed from work areas. This includes removing excess material and disposing of it immediately. To adhere to the principles of the policy, we follow a set of guidelines. These include ensuring that all cutting activities are conducted at designated cut stations and that cords are elevated eight feet from the ground rather than placed directly on the floor. Additionally, we store materials on carts, racks, shelves, or dunnage to prevent them from touching the ground. Our workplace's success relies on each team member's dedication to the nothing hits the floor policy. Together, we create a clean, organized, and safe work environment. Poor housekeeping causes trips, falls, and creates fire hazards. Poor housekeeping is unprofessional. Good housekeeping is critical to having a safe and healthy job site. It makes work more efficient and is the sign of a great project team. A fire extinguisher is required for every 3,000 square feet of work area. The travel distance to an extinguisher is not to exceed 100 feet. Extinguishers are to be located throughout the job site on every floor in an accessible location. Extinguishers shall be inspected by a member of the White's project team on a monthly basis. Gasoline must be stored in self-sealing safety cans only. Non-safety cans do not self-close and will spill. Plastic gas cans are not to be used on White's projects. Welding and hot work require an additional fire extinguisher. Inspect the area before starting and remove any flammable or combustible materials. A hot work permit will be issued at the discretion of the project team. The White's project team has the authority to warn, suspend, and remove from the project any worker for failure to follow safety rules. A willful fall protection, trenching, or electrical violation will result in termination without warning. Reporting for work under the influence of alcohol or drugs or the consumption of them during the workday or on White's company job sites will be grounds for termination. The sale, manufacture, distribution, possession, or use of drugs and other controlled substances is absolutely prohibited. The White's company is committed to providing a drug-free workplace for its employees and subcontractors. All injuries have a cause and can be prevented. However, despite our best efforts, injuries can still occur. We must be prepared to respond quickly to injuries and incidents. Ensure the accident scene is safe and secure before attempting a rescue or providing first aid to a coworker. In the event of a serious or life-threatening injury, fire, or other event, call the emergency phone number posted for your job site. In most cases, you will call 911. All injuries and accidents must be reported immediately to the project superintendent. Quick reporting of injuries will ensure that proper medical treatment is received. Each job site must have emergency processes and procedures in place. 
and investigation will ensure corrective actions are taken. Reporting injuries and incidents will prevent them from being repeated. At the White's Company, we are dedicated to your health and well-being. Opportunities to find better work-life balance, pursue greater levels of fitness, sleep better, and manage stress and workloads are all part of our collective conversation. Recent initiatives are focused on building a culture of care through mental health awareness and response training. Our signature wellness engagement tools have been customized to you as an employee working on and for our construction projects. The well-being tools range from personal planning worksheets to generate greater hope and enthusiasm for the future, team challenges that contribute to a sense of belonging, complimentary and confidential connections to financial, legal, or mental health counselors, and incentives for preventative screenings to optimize your health for your age and stage. This concludes the video portion of your safety orientation. Welcome to the White's Company. Make a commitment today to lead with safety to prevent injuries.